Hello everyone and welcome back to DBX Labs. In today's video we are going to be looking at a project I've been working on for quite a few months now and that is building a Birkeland Ide reactor to produce nitrogen dioxide gas. This reactor can be used to produce concentrated nitric acid from nothing but air and electricity. Now before we start off this video I just want to tell you guys about my newly set goal on my Patreon. The goal is that if we ever get to $25 a month, I will produce a full kilogram of nitrocellulose, otherwise known as gun cotton, to ignite all at once in a tremendous fireball. I have not decided if this will be a video only for patrons or not, but I know for certain that patrons would be able to see it at least a week or two in advance. Any donations on my Patreon are used to solely help fund my lab expenses, which get quite costly at times. So anything would help out a ton, you can find the link to it down below. Now on to making nitric acid. So for a long time now I've been interested in the processes behind nitrogen fixation, both bacterial and atmospheric. As a matter of fact, in one of my earlier videos I looked at the nitrogen fixation processes that occur with urine over time. While the bacterial route to produce saltpeter from urine is quite intriguing and effective, I am of the firm belief that using high voltage to produce nitrates from air is a far more exciting, albeit less effective way to produce nitrates in a lab environment. To put it bluntly, I'd rather work with toxic nitrogen dioxide gas any day over working another day with DBX piss. Okay, so what is a Birkeland Ide reactor? Wikipedia can tell you a lot more than you need to know about it, but basically it utilizes a small electrical arc produced by high voltages to pyrolyze a portion of the atmosphere in a given container and convert that into nitrogen dioxide by breaking down the bonds between the diatomic nitrogen and the diatomic oxygen. An amount of that pyrolyzed air cools down to form the nitrogen-oxygen bond, yielding us nitric oxide, which on contact with excess oxygen yields nitrogen dioxide, a reddish-brown gas. This nitrogen dioxide gas can then be sent to an air bubbler apparatus, which produces a large enough surface area for the nitrogen dioxide to dissolve inside a given amount of water. When dissolved in water, the gas produces a mixture of both nitric and nitrous acids, the latter slowly decomposing into the former. The end result is a solution of nitric acid that slowly increases in concentration at a relatively constant rate. Before the Haber-Bosch and Ostwald processes were introduced, this method was widely used commercially. However, it was widely inefficient as most reactors couldn't pyrolyze more than a small portion of the air in a given reactor. With powerful magnets, the size and shape of plasma in the electrical arc could be manipulated, but only to an extent in even the best scenario where a full disk of plasma could be created, only a small amount of the air going in was actually pyrolyzed into nitric oxide, subsequently meaning that most energy was wasted in the process. These industrial reactors peaked out at about 60 grams of nitric acid per kilowatt hour. While it would be great if my level of production was that high, I have a feeling that my reactor fell far short of it, so we'll do some testing at the end of this video to find out just how productive my reactor really was. Now onto the route in which I built my reactor. Now when I first began this project, I made a lot of broad assumptions such as thinking that I could use a plastic vessel to house the electrical arc and all the plasma that it would create. This of course turned out to be extremely wrong and I made a change of plans to switch to using only glass vessels to house the electrical arc. The vessel of choice that I landed on was a three neck 500 milliliter round bottom flask. When turned upside down, the two side legs could act as inputs and outputs, while the middle leg could serve to both plug and introduce electrical wiring into the apparatus. While making inputs and outputs was as simple as buying two glass 2440 hose adapters, creating an insulative and airtight steel to the middle neck was very difficult, and it took many hours to finally come up with the idea to use plumber's putty as the main form of sealant, uh, which would allow the wiring to pass into the neck and form the Jacob's Ladder mechanism. Plumber's Putty also did a good job of resisting nitrogen dioxide corrosion and it could also be covered with epoxy and resin or hot glue or silicone sealant and a variety of other things I've used to really seal up that remainder of the middle neck although I found that the best way to go about it for a long-term steel was to use the plumber's putty first, 
then to put some epoxy and resin and then cover the rest of it with a ton of hot glue. Now, as I hinted to before, the main arcing mechanism of the reactor is a Jacob's Ladder powered by a 7.5 kilovolt neon sign transformer. These transformers output 30 milliamps and go for about $30 on eBay. The pump that I used was pretty much your standard cheap aquarium air pump. And the air diffuser that I used was practically a miniature Buchner funnel, which of course is chemically resistant to any acid being produced. The first iteration of the reactor was really based around the premise that any nitrogen dioxide produced through the reactor would be dissolved through the water fairly rapidly. So it never had a pump in it, and it actually worked fairly well. It produced acid that was fairly concentrated to the point where it react with sodium bicarbonate. It might, it, it actually even reacted with the, uh, the concrete floor I was working on. At some point I realized that the actual flaw of this setup was nitrogen dioxide didn't dissolve in water quick enough to create a vacuum pulling more air into the reactor to produce more nitrogen dioxide as oxygen was necessary to convert the nitrogen oxide into nitrogen dioxide. Basically, this just explains the need for an actual pump to push more air into the reactor while it's up and running. The first pumps I used were manual pumps that I would operate at various times in the day, but they were kind of tedious because if I wasn't going to it every hour or so to pump more air into the reactor, it was really at a standstill with no oxygen being pumped in, or atmospheric nitrogen for that matter. Eventually, I settled on a cheap 2 PSI aquarium pump off eBay, and it really does the job quite well of pumping air into the reactor. Now, at this point, the reactor was running really quite smoothly. It would produce approximately 1.5 grams of nitric acid on a daily basis. However, this fine rate of production came to a screeching halt one day when I went outside to find that in a thunderstorm, the entire apparatus had fallen off of the bench that I was working on at that point and fell onto the concrete floor, shattering and spilling all the produced acid, which reacted with the concrete floor and actually left a pretty decent sized marking on it. You guys ever break some glassware and not want to clean it up? Not because it's broken glassware and it has to be cleaned up and you really don't want to touch all the broken glass and all, but rather because it costs a lot of money and you know you have to replace it and it's hard to think about how much of a loss of money it was or a loss of time that's kind of how I feel right now don't worry this won't be the end of the project but I am going to have to put it on hold for just a little bit while I'm waiting for replacement parts to come in the mail that's another seventy five dollars down the drain but in the end I hope it will be worth it because it's it's been addressed on YouTube a couple times before but not really in the depth that I'd imagine you'd have for a process that has been documented for well over a hundred years now okay everyone it's been nine days since I sort of rebooted the setup that was of course after the neon sign transformer broke down and the glass broke even before that and I replaced the tubing connecting uh, the bubbler to the reactor with PTFE tubing. As you can see bubbling is going strong. We, we got a lot of bubbles. Not as fine as I'd like them to be. I'm sure there's still some nitrogen dioxide escaping. After nine days of bubbling, we're left with an extremely acidic solution of nitric acid. Before anything catastrophic can happen to my setup again, I'm going to stop the running of this batch and we'll see how much acid we've created and what we can do with that. As you can see, we have 500 mils of the acid. Last time I did a test of this solution, I found that it could produce about 31 grams of ammonium nitrate if I fully reacted it all with ammonia. And that's what we plan to do, so hopefully that should be a little bit higher because the last time I tested it was three to four days ago. Basically what we're going to do now is decant this acid into a larger beaker. And we're going to begin neutralizing it with this 10% ammonia. Okay, I'm guessing that it'll take a good, maybe, 
60 to 100 mils of the ammonium hydroxide to fully neutralize the acid. And since we're right at the 450 mark right now, we'll stop at the 500, see where we're at. And we're still acidic. Now there's been a very noticeable color change and I can't really attribute that to the ammonium nitrate simply because ammonium nitrate doesn't have a color. It's white when pure. So I'm thinking that it's actually the result of this, uh, this latex tubing I was using before. As you can see, the part that was in contact with the acid solution was bleached white. So my best guess is we're going to have a little bit of coloration in there simply because uh, it kind of leached out all the um, whatever coloring was given to this latex to turn it reddish orange. This shouldn't make a difference because in the end we're just using this ammonium nitrate to do a few different experiments and uh, to make concentrated nitric acid as red fuming nitric acid and the way we're going to do that is simply a distillation so any contamination will be lost in that process. So we take the neutralized solution, which is now basic because it has excess ammonia in it, and we put it on the hot plate, start stirring it, and crank up the heat. So as we start boiling the solution down, the first thing that leaves the solution is our excess ammonia. As for the rest of the solution, it will concentrate further and further until it gets down to probably 10 to 1 ammonium nitrate to water. And at that point, we begin to see the stages uh, that come along with crystallizing out those crystals of ammonium nitrate. I mainly say the stages because you don't really get a clean deposition of ammonium nitrate crystals at the bottom of the beaker. Because ammonium nitrate is so soluble in water, it really gets to a syrup before it starts crystallizing out, and that means it starts bubbling a ton even before you get to the desirable concentration that you can crystallize out the vast majority of your ammonium nitrate. It eventually gets to the point where when we take the solution off the hot plate, we quickly see the formation of tons of needle-like crystals, and those are the crystals of our ammonium nitrate which rapidly precipitate out to really crash out all of the ammonium nitrate, we throw it in the fridge for about an hour, and when it comes back out, we have a pretty thick deposit of the stuff at the bottom of the beaker. To really get rid of all the residual water here, we take the sludgy mass of ammonium nitrate we get coming out of the fridge and throw it on some parchment paper on a pan, and we put it in the oven at just around 100 degrees Celsius. In no less than 20 minutes, we get to the point where the entirety of our ammonium nitrate is now anhydrous, so we take it out of the oven, and at this point, we can crack it up a bit so it's easy to work with, and then we throw it into a plastic bag to pulverize it into a powder. When we weigh out this ammonium nitrate, we find that we got 24.75 grams over the 9-day period of production. That nine days of production works out to 216 hours, of which I was continuously running a 225-watt neon sign transformer. This in total is 48.6 kilowatt hours used to produce the 24.75 grams. Priced at the U.S. average rate of 10 cents per kilowatt hour, this cost me approximately $4.86. Going a step further, we find that the cost of production per gram is roughly 20 cents. This isn't that bad. I mean, it really is pretty bad. I, I can buy a 10 pound bag of ammonium nitrate off Amazon for 20 bucks. But in comparison to retailers that sell the stuff in low quantities like home science tools, it's approximately the same price per gram. Looking at the differences in molar mass between ammonium nitrate and nitric acid, we can conclude that we produced approximately 19.5 grams of nitric acid over the nine day period. Comparing our rate of production to the 60 grams per kilowatt hour that was capable on the industrial scale, we see that we are a little bit off. Of our 24.75 grams of ammonium nitrate, we take 14.75 grams and begin our process of producing red fuming nitric acid. 
To do this, we set up a pretty basic distillation apparatus in which we combine our ammonium nitrate with concentrated sulfuric acid and heat it to the point where we have nitric acid condensing and being collected in a receiving beaker. In the end, we distill over 10 milliliters of our yellow red fuming nitric acid. It's called red fuming nitric acid not because of the color of it, although sometimes it will look red, but most of the time it looks yellow. And that yellow is due to the presence of nitrogen dioxide and tetroxide and some pentoxide. But the red is attributed to the reddish brown nitrogen dioxide fumes that come off of the liquid at room temperature in open air. The first thing that we do with the acid is test out its oxidizing properties by dripping some of it onto a blue nitrile glove. This is a classic reaction used to both demonstrate the oxidizing properties of the red fuming nitric acid and used to confirm the actual concentration of it as if it's not fully red fuming nitric acid it will not actually catch the glove on fire. The other thing that we do with the acid is react it with a fully copper US penny. Again the acid exhibits some unusual properties due to being of the red fuming variety. The most notable being that the acid does not immediately react with the penny upon contact with it, and that's because it forms a passivation oxidation layer, forming copper oxide and copper nitrate. These copper salts coat the penny and protect it from being further oxidized by the acid, but when a little bit of water is added, it will dissolve these salts, allowing for further contact with the penny and a continuation of the reaction. It's at this point that we see the reaction take full effect and a lot of reddish brown nitrogen dioxide gas is produced. This passivization layer is only characteristic of red fuming nitric acid and white fuming nitric acid, and any azeotropic 68% nitric acid will not exhibit this at all. To finish off the video, I make a mixture of magnesium powder and our remaining ammonium nitrate. This acts as a sort of flash powder and we see the thermite-like reaction it produces If you guys enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing, and I'll see you guys in the next video.